you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my god, I would love a cup of tea, thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Then you can make them a cup of tea, or not, but be aware that they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important bit, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you're entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say, no thank you, then don't make them tea. At all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes please, that's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying, as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind, and you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they are unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea, and they can't answer the question, do you want tea, because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea, and they said yes, but in the time it took you to boil the kettle or brew the tea and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down, make sure the unconscious person is safe, and this is the important part again, don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they are safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it, going, but you wanted tea last week, or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat, going, but you wanted tea last night. If you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you are able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea. Well, that video was produced eight years ago by Thames Valley Police in response to an issue which has become increasingly recognised in our culture. Um, it was made a little before the infamous milkshake video, if you remember that one, um, was made here in Australia. Now, consent is our topic for today. And while it may seem like it's a recent buzzword about sexual behaviour, it was actually part of a sexual revolution that happened a couple of thousand years ago. So we're going to talk about that topic. Now, if as we talk about this topic today, it becomes difficult for you and you want to talk to someone after the service, then please talk to me, talk to one of our elders, talk to someone that you know here in our congregation who you trust but we're going to talk about this topic, and as we do so, it would be good for us to pray. So, Father, we just ask that once again, you would remind us that you love us and you care for us. And it's an extraordinary reality that when Jesus came to earth, he didn't force himself on anyone. You are the God who offers us a relationship with you. You're not a God who forces us to be saved by you. You're a God who has made us in your image and given us the opportunity to make decisions, given us the dignity and the responsibility. And Father, we, we need to know the beauty of your love in our life and through our life. And so we pray that you would speak to us of that today. In Jesus' name, amen. In 2018, a lady by the name of Rachel Den Hollander stood before the microphone in a courthouse to deliver her victim impact statement. She was the last of 156 women to do so in this case. 
just as she had been the very first to come forward and speak out about the sexual abuse that she experienced at the hands of the sexual predator Larry Nassar. He had used his position as US Olympic gymnastics team doctor to exploit at least 265 women and girls in his care. In the years following her abuse, Den Hollander had trained to become a lawyer herself in order to help others who found themselves in similar situations. As she spoke, she wanted to draw the court's attention to one striking question. How much is a little girl worth? As she concluded her wrenching statement, she turned to the judge and she said, Judge Aquilina, I plead with you as you deliberate the sentence to give Larry, send a message that these victims are worth everything. I plead with you to impose the maximum sentence under the plea agreement because everything is what these survivors are worth. Thank you. Nassar actually received multiple sentences, totaling over 200 years, guaranteeing that he'll never leave jail again. The message was sent. Girls, victims, survivors, the vulnerable are worth everything. Sadly, that's not always how the justice system works. Many survivors find the process of doing so, of reporting these things, of reliving these events too traumatic. Others find the result is heartbreakingly disappointing. According to the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Research, for every 100 reported assaults in New South Wales, only 15 go to trial and less than half of that result in convictions. But this doesn't change the answer to the question, how much is a little girl or a little boy worth? The air we breathe in Western society inspires one answer. They're worth everything. It causes us to feel heartbreak when we hear that, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, one in five women and one in 20 men in Australia have experienced sexual violence. Today, pedophilia is regarded as the most dreadful of crimes. Among prisoners, sex offenders are considered the lowest of the low. While today these attitudes are considered to be some of the most basic, universal and obvious values imaginable, they are historically nothing of the sort. Glenn Scrivener, in his book, The Air We Breathe, tells us this about our past. If you asked a Roman how much is a little girl worth, they might have offered a number of answers. She's free if you manage to salvage her as a baby from the rubbish heap where she was exposed. If slave traders got to her first, then you'd have to pay them perhaps eight months' wages to own her. Once yours, though, her body belongs to you outright. It is accepted that every master is entitled to use his slave as he desires. If, though, you wanted a girl purely on a pay-as-you-go basis, prostitution was, in the words of historian Kyle Harper, a dominant institution flourishing in the light of day. The sex industry was integral to the moral economy of the classic world. A quick visit to the nearest brothel, and they were everywhere, would set you back the price of a loaf of bread. So why did things change? Why are things different in our culture today? The answer is Christianity. Jesus unequivocally changed the estimated value of a life when he said in Matthew 18 verse 6, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. In saying this, Jesus reset the value categories of the ancient world from the status that society gives people to the status that God gives to people. You see, in the ancient world, it was the status of the person that you sexually touched, not their consent or their age or their gender that mattered. As classics professor Kyle Harper writes, 
In the sexual life of the Roman Empire, it would be impossible to overstate the decisive influence of social position in the determination of sexual boundaries. And societal basis was founded upon the idea of honour and shame. If you had a higher level of honour, if you had position or wealth or status, and the other person was already inferior socially, which was pretty much anyone other than a Roman male citizen, it didn't matter what you did to them because they were already degraded, they were already inferior, they were already shameful. So here's the first point, if you're following along in the notes today. In the ancient world, what mattered was not what someone did, but who was doing it to whom. In the ancient world, what mattered was not what someone did, but who was doing it to whom. Unsurprisingly, this meant that there was a massive differential, not just between classes, but between male and female. Of course, high-born women and wives of Roman citizens were off limits as their honour reflected upon their husband, so they must remain chaste. A man was meant to honour the modesty of such a woman. Adultery was a very serious crime, but only within a very narrow definition. Sleeping with the wife of another Roman citizen's wife was, sorry, of another Roman citizen, was a major transgression, not against your own wife, but against yourself and the other woman's husband or father. It was shameful because it showed a lack of moderation or self-control. It had nothing to do with chastity and sexual faithfulness to your own partner. Adultery was only adultery when it was against the wife or daughter of a respected Roman citizen. Because if a male Roman citizen had sexual desires, there were plenty of other opportunities to satisfy them. As Glenn Scrivener says, what this meant in practice was that slaves and prostitutes were used infrequently as a sop for the lusts of men so that they wouldn't indulge them with married women. A trip to the brothel might well be taken in the name of modesty, the male variety anyway. So here's the next point. Roman sexual boundaries were about power and status, social and politically. They were certainly not about concern for others. Roman sexual boundaries were about power and status, not about concern for others. The ideas of romance and erotica that pepper our movies and our books and our songs today would be foreign to the ancient world. Sex was rarely about affection in a world which was obsessed with honour and shame. Tom Holland, in his book Dominion, writes this, Sex was nothing if not an exercise of power in the Roman world. As captured cities were to the swords of the legion, so the bodies of those used sexually were to the Roman man. To be penetrated, male or female, was to be branded as inferior to be marked as womanish, barbarian, servile. In Rome, men no more hesitated to use slaves and prostitutes to relieve themselves of their sexual needs than they did to use the side of the road as a toilet. In Latin, the same word, meo, meant both ejaculate and urinate. So the idea of consent, mutuality, Equality were just not used in the sexual vocabulary. And this explains why Latin has 25 words for prostitute and no words for a male virgin. The very things that strike us today as abusive, power plays, inequality, objectification, clinical sexual use of bodies and persons... These were, in fact, presumed in the sexual morality of the day. That was just business as usual. But then came the sexual revolution. Now, we're not talking about the swinging 60s of Woodstock, but the first century sexual revolution that gave the world its particular understandings that it has today of sex and love and freedom of choice, the body, family, gender and equality which operate 
into our current world, even among those who consider themselves free from the church's prescriptions. Not that the 1960s and the first century revolutions weren't related, just in mirrored terms. You see, while in the 1960s, there was this, sort of this idea to confront gender equality by loosening the taboos for female sexuality. The first century revolution confronted gender equality by bringing male sexuality in line with female sexuality. The Jesus revolution said, men must be as restricted and faithful as women in their sexuality. Jesus gets up and says, men must be as restricted and faithful as women in their sexuality. Let's bring these things back into line. Now, considering the sexual supremacy of the male in the ancient world, this claim was as brazen as it was transformative. In fact, when Jesus spoke of this idea, his own male disciples couldn't believe there is. When answering a question about marriage and divorce, Jesus says, as read to us before, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. In saying this, Jesus radically changes the focus of sexuality. Instead of being about a male serving his own sexual desire, it's about being exclusively faithful to his wife. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. I like the way Glenn Scrivener puts it very succinctly. He says, in the Bible, sex is marital and marriage is sexual. In the Bible, sex is marital and marriage is sexual. The one flesh act of sex belongs in the one flesh union of marriage. Sex is of deep significance and deserves deep commitment. But Jesus goes deeper still, further still. Jesus includes a spiritual component. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Next point, what we do with our flesh is also spiritual. What we do with our flesh is also spiritual. What we do with our flesh is not simply personal. What we do with our flesh is not simply physical. What we do with our flesh is not simply emotional. What we do with our flesh is not simply social. Our world recognises these things, but what we do with our flesh is, not, it is also spiritual. Our human partnerships are not just human. They matter to God. In saying this, Jesus is closing the door, not just on the casual sex of the Roman Empire, but on the epidemic of easy divorce that existed in the Jewish world. Jesus' comments alarm his Jewish listeners, so they appeal to the Old Testament. It goes on, Matthew 19, Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Jesus reminds his listeners that not all things that are recorded in the Old Testament, like Solomon's 1,000 concubines, are prescriptions for us. Instead, they're recorded as cautionary tales that show us what not to do. Instead, he says, it was not this way from the beginning. It wasn't this way in the beginning. As with all other matters, Jesus' entry into the world is to bring about a revolution that returned to the original pattern of how things were in the beginning. In other words, in Genesis 1 and 2. God's original intent for marriage was between one man and one woman for life. Divorce is allowed in but rare exceptions. To the males around Jesus, not used to seeking the consent of their wives, how do you think this went down? 
Matthew chapter 9 and verse 10, we read this. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it's better not to marry. Now, I'm not sure how the wives of the disciples reacted to this comment when they heard about it. But the disciples themselves are shocked enough. And I imagine they were left cold by what Jesus says next. Verse 11 and 12, Jesus replied, Not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. There are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Now, a eunuch was a man without testicles often forcibly castrated as a slave, so as not to be a threat to the master's wives. Jesus reminds us that no matter what our sexual status, no matter what our our social sexual status may be, our physical sexual status, whatever, we are able to be part of the fullness of what it means for a human who breathes the air of God's kingdom. So Jesus is saying, next point, God intends a world where each human, male and female, high or low born, has power of consent over their own body and never takes away consent from another person. God's intent is for a world where each human, male and female, high or low born, has the power of consent over their own body and never takes consent away from someone else. People discovered that this God was different from the ancient gods because he actually takes human beings seriously, respectably, and in a dignified manner. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 even tells us, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? So Jesus is offering empowerment to live faithfully and not be constrained by the desires that we often regret giving into. This beautiful unfolding of this means restraint leads to freedom. Can you see the radical transformation this would have produced, not only in among slaves in the household and treatment of women in general, but it would have meant a whole new dimension to family stability in society. Followers of Jesus began to spread a very different picture of male and female relationships. Galatians chapter 5 tells us, So in Christ you are all children of God through faith. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The advice of the first followers of Jesus was to see sexual activity as an act of giving rather than taking, involving mutual consideration of the other person involved. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul writes this, he says, The husband should fulfil his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, then come together again. This phrase, mutual consent, was revolutionary. This idea that males should be listening to the needs of their wives, that wives should be listening to the needs of their husbands, that together, mutually, they should be talking and discussing and deciding on things. This was revolutionary. It's no surprise that sociologist Rodney Stark writes in his book, The Triumph of Christianity, this was before Rodney Stark said, I think I will become a Christian after all. He writes, when the circumstances of pagan and Christian women are compared... The wonder is that all of the women in the Roman Empire didn't flock into the church. You see, the Jesus revolution said that relationships are not about power, they are about love. Relationships are not about power, they're about love. And a particular kind of love, the kind of love that Jesus demonstrated. Jesus made it really simple, didn't he? He says, love God. Love your neighbour 
love your enemies. Out of the Jesus movement came one of literature's most well-known and beautiful passages. 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonour others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So to finish off with, we we can't finish without returning to where we began and the idea of the treatment of children. Larry Hurtado, in his book, Destroyer of the Gods, tells us that in the ancient world, sex with boys and girls was not merely tolerated, it was celebrated by writers like Juvenal, Petronius, Horace, Strato, Lucian and Philostratus. The word they used was pederasty, which translated was love of children. Christians were appalled by the practice though and they used a different term, piedophthoros, which means destruction of children. In fact, it wasn't until the reign of the Christian Emperor Justinian, who lived at the end of the 6th century, where pederasty was outlawed and could actually be prosecuted well after the offence took place. So today, we take our loathing of sexual abuse of children for granted. But that is only because the Jesus Revolution and his church laid the groundwork for the state to legislate against the sexualization of children. But when that's the case, how sad it is that those who claim a Christian identity have been among the worst abusers on the planet. And this was true of Larry Nassar abuser of gymnasts in Rachel Den Hollander's impact statement she said to him in our early hearings you brought your bible into the courtroom and you have spoken of praying for forgiveness you know as Jesus foreshadowed we must watch out for wolves in sheep's clothing predators who masquerade as believers instead of decrying her abusers, Rachel professed and, and, and decrying his, his um, Christian declaration, instead of saying, you're not a Christian, she actually holds him to that. She says, the Bible you carry says it's better for a stone to be hung around your neck and you thrown into a lake than for you to make even one child stumble and you have damaged hundreds You know, the the horror that we feel at crimes like this illustrate the worth of the victims who suffer it. And it demonstrates just how deeply Jesus has shaped us. Den Hollander puts it like this. She says, throughout this process, I have clung to a quote by C.S. Lewis, where he says, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust, but how did I get this idea of just unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he first has some idea of straight. What was I comparing the universe to when I called it unjust? Larry, Rachel said, I can call what you did evil and wicked because it was. And I know it was evil and wicked because the straight line exists. The straight line is not measured based on your perception or anyone else's perception. And this means I can speak the truth about my abuse without minimization or mitigation. And I can call it evil because I know what goodness is. Den Hollander is able to call Nassar's acts evil. But it does not mean unforgivable. She went on to offer her abuser forgiveness in the same statement, a remarkably Christian action. She said, should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you have done, the guilt will be crushing. 
And that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet, because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found. And it will be there for you. I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt, so that you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me, though I extend that to you as well. She extended forgiveness not because the act of abuse wasn't wrong, not just unpleasant or painful or culturally inappropriate. In fact, she extends the offer of forgiveness because the act was wrong, because it was wrong and it required forgiveness. It was wrong with a capital D. W. And if it really was wrong, then there is something that is right, right with a capital R. For abuse to be called abuse, we have to believe certain things are right, that bodies should be treated as temples, that sex is sacred, that children are valuable, and the powerful should serve the weak, not exploit them. These values are the straight line which is drawn by Jesus. The Jesus who did not stay silent, but spoke out against the lack of consent in his world. Who spoke about a God who loved with dignity, a God who loved with kindness and gentleness, a God who loved by serving, a God who was willing to come to earth and be abused himself, not just verbally, not just relationally, but physically abused himself on that cross and was yet willing, even in that clear demonstration of wrongness, was willing to demonstrate the rightness of forgiveness. And that forgiveness is for any one of us who have done wrong. And for those of us who have done wrong and have never confessed it, then we say the same thing. Pray that you may know the crushing weight of guilt so that you may confess it and know the incredibly liberating power of the forgiveness of the Jesus who loves you. Jesus enables us to follow his straight line, and that is the only way. It is the only way back to the good and the beautiful life, the straight line of Jesus. He enables us to follow that straight line if our heartfelt response is that, Jesus, I want to confess. I want to be free. For those of us who suffered someone else's abuse, Jesus comes alongside of us and he gives to us his own ability to forgive, his own ability to be healed, his own ability to know that there is something different, his own ability to say to us, you are defined by my love, not by the status that someone else gave you, not by the status that someone else imposed upon you. You can have my status because as far as I'm concerned, little boys and little girls are worth everything. And you know what? If your heartfelt response to the question, what is a little girl worth? as Rachel asked, is everything, then you are echoing back the value that Jesus placed upon you. It's evident in our world. You are worth everything. And Jesus gave it all for you. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you that you demonstrated in yourself that even the worst, even the ugliest, even the most awful actions that humanity produces are things that you would willingly enter into, experience, show up to be wrong, but demonstrate that you are greater than those things. Lord Jesus, some of us this day just hold on to the fact that you, you, Lord Jesus, 
were an abused one. And yet you show us the way forward. You show us the way out from underneath the shadow of that abuse. Because you will love us and you will heal us and you will give us a status that is so much greater. Lord, some of us here today feel great conviction because of things that have happened in the past or in fact perhaps things that are happening now. We are convicted by you. And Lord Jesus, we want to repent of those things and we pray would you help us to do so. Lord Jesus, do not help us to do so simply by giving us a get out of jail free card but Lord Jesus help us to enter into the horror and the agony of the guilt that is brought that shows us the wrongness of what we have done but then allows us in recognizing that to identify with the reality that Jesus took abuse himself and was able to forgive and so he is able to forgive us also when we confess to him Lord Jesus, you are the God who is Lord over the abused and the abuser. It is a thing too big for our human minds to understand. And so we would leave in your hands justice. Lord, we pray for justice on this earth. We pray for more opportunities as Rachel and her fellow gymnasts experienced, opportunities to see justice done here on this earth. God, we pray for those moments. We pray that you will help us to cooperate with justice, to seek it. But Lord, also we pray that you will teach us forgiveness and graciousness and mercy. Lord, we need your transformation in us and in our world. So we lift our eyes to you, Lord. Whether our eyes be bowed in shame at what someone else has done or at what we have done. We want to lift our eyes to you and to see what you, the God who came on the cross, can do to change us. Upon you, Lord Jesus, we rely. Amen. We're going to stand and sing one more song together before we finish our service, so let's stand.